Isn't it just mind-blowing to think about filming stuff up on Mount Everest? But let me tell you, digging into the stories behind those videos can be seriously hard to believe. I've gathered up a bunch of stories about some crazy stuff happening at the very top of this mountain, so get ready to find out what's really true about this place. 10. George Mallory and Sandy Irvine While there's been a lot of talk about Sir Edmund Hillary's epic climb up Mount Everest back in 1953, there's a whole other side to the mountain's story. Let's go back to 1924, almost 30 years before Hillary's climb, to George Mallory and Sandy Irvine's attempt to reach the summit. George Mallory was no stranger to Everest. He had already been part of two expeditions before 1924. He wasn't just climbing for fun. He was a pioneer, the first to map out Everest's western side and try using oxygen for climbing. Back then, using oxygen was a big deal, a game-changer for climbing in the thin air up high. Then there's Sandy Irvine, the new guy with a knack for fixing the oxygen gear they needed. Even though he wasn't as experienced in climbing, his skills were crucial. It goes to show that sometimes it's not just about how many mountains you've climbed, but what you know that counts. Together with their team, Mallory and Irvine set off, leaving a camp full of hopeful teammates. A guide lower down the mountain saw a snowstorm coming and yelled for them to come back. That shout was the last anyone heard from them. The next day, a search turned up nothing but their empty sleeping bags. Their disappearance remained a mystery until 1999, when climbers found Mallory's body. But there was no camera with him, which might have shown if they made it to the top. Mallory had said he'd leave a photo of his wife at the summit, but it wasn't found with him, making people wonder if they had reached the top before they died. So while Hillary's climb is famous, Mallory and Irvine's story adds a whole layer of mystery and what-ifs to Everest's history. 9. The Swiss Machine One thing you got to know about Ueli Steck, they called him the Swiss Machine in the climbing world. He was like a superstar up there. Steck had a dream bigger than most. He wanted to climb Mount Everest from two sides in one go. This wasn't just talk. He had a history of tackling climbs that would scare off most, like Annapurna. He climbed with a speed and smoothness that was almost unbelievable. He had a way of making difficult climbs look easy, which earned him a lot of respect and admiration. At 40, Steck was getting ready for a huge challenge, to climb Everest and Lotze without using extra oxygen. He wanted to take a route that had not been tried since 1963, showing just how tough this challenge was. Sadly, in April 2017, the climbing community was hit with the tragic news of Steck's accident on Everest. He fell a long way during a climb, meant to get used to the altitude, which cost him his life. Everyone, including National Geographic photographer Corey Richards, felt the loss deeply recognizing how much Steck had contributed to climbing. Steck's passing was the first loss of the 2017 Everest climbing season, reminding everyone of the dangers of climbing these high mountains. Yet, it's exactly this kind of danger that drew in climbers like Steck. He was always chasing the thrill and challenge of the mountains, which even got him the National Geographic Adventurer of the Year Award in 2015. One of his standout moments was climbing Annapurna by himself in 28 hours, earning him the Piolet d'Or, a top mountaineering award. Even after surviving a nearly deadly fall on Annapurna in 2007, Steck's spirit never wavered. Starting to climb instead of playing hockey at 12, Steck's love for the mountains led him to accomplish incredible things, like setting a speed record on the Eiger Nordwand. His career, though filled with success, also faced controversies, like a disagreement with Sherpas on Everest. 8. Jim Davidson Jim Davidson's story isn't just about getting through the tough times brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. It starts with a terrifying experience on Mount Everest in 2015. Jim, who loves mountain climbing, was trying to reach the top of Everest 
when a huge earthquake hit, causing two avalanches. He and about 180 other climbers were stuck at 19,700 feet up on a narrow strip of ice, completely cut off by the snow rushing down the mountain. Somehow they all survived the avalanches without getting hurt, but they were trapped. They couldn't be rescued by helicopter because of a snowstorm, and they ran out of food and water. With the ground still shaking from aftershocks, the situation looked grim. The local Sherpas did their best to keep everyone calm. It was 40 hours before Jim could be safely taken off the mountain. That day turned out to be the deadliest in Everest's history, with 19 climbers losing their lives and nearly 9,000 people dying across Nepal because of the earthquake. Jim wrote about this scary experience in his book, The Next Everest, but this wasn't the first time he had faced danger. Back in 1992, he had a bad fall on Mount Rainier that killed his climbing partner and left Jim badly injured. Instead of giving up, these close calls made him even more determined to face challenges head on, something he says he learned while working for his dad's painting business when he was younger. Feeling a strong bond with Nepal and its people, Jim decided to try climbing Everest again in 2017. Hi, this is Jim Davidson. I'm at 12,000 feet. By then, he was 54, in good shape, and mentally ready to tackle the mountain that had almost been the end of him. This attempt was shadowed by the memories of the 2015 disaster and the loss of fellow climbers, including the well-known Ueli Steck. But Jim made it to the top this time. Reaching the summit was a huge achievement for him showing the amazing things people can do when they don't give up, even when nature throws its toughest challenges at them. 7. Weird Sounds Mount Everest has always had its share of mysteries, telling its tales to the night sky. People living nearby and climbers with lots of experience talk about a spooky sound that fills the air when the sun goes down. It's like the mountain itself is making noise. One climber, who's been to the top of Everest 15 times, said it sounded like huge avalanches of ice and snow falling from really high up on the mountain. But for a long time, everyone was puzzled by these sounds. Some even thought it was the mountain spirit making noise at night as a way of showing its anger. But now, thanks to science, we've got a clearer picture. Researchers from Japan and Nepal teamed up and found out that the sounds are due to something called nocturnal thermal fracturing. This fancy term means that when it gets really cold at night, the ice and glaciers on Everest start cracking and breaking apart, which causes them to fall down the mountain, making a lot of noise. This study was published in a journal called Geophysical Research Letters, and the scientists used special equipment to listen to the mountain. They found out that the big temperature changes from day to night on Everest's glaciers cause these scary sounds. This happens more on the thinner glaciers, showing how the cold at night, which can get down to minus 42 degrees Celsius, really changes the mountain. So, what used to be thought of as Everest's way of crying out is just a natural process happening because of how cold it gets. Six, death zone. Going higher than 8,000 meters up a mountain, like Mount Everest, puts you in what climbers call the death zone. It's super tough for the human body up there. Even though the air still has the same amount of oxygen, it's so thin that you don't get as much with each breath. At the top of Mount Everest, you're only getting about one-third of the oxygen you'd get at sea level, making it super hard on your body. Your body starts to fight hard against not having enough oxygen which is something called hypoxia. It begins with feeling dizzy and having a headache, but it can get serious fast, leading to confusion, bad decisions, and even death. Your brain can't do its job without enough oxygen, affecting how you think and act. Muscles get weak. Breathing feels like a huge effort, and climbers might get hape, where the lungs fill with fluid. This makes it even harder for oxygen to get into the blood. 
The body tries to fix this by making more red blood cells, which makes the blood thicker and puts extra pressure on the heart. If things get really bad, the skin might turn a bluish color because of the lack of oxygen, which is a big warning sign. Without help, this can lead to organs failing, passing out, seizures, and death. There's a place called Rainbow Valley on Everest that's sadly named after the gear of climbers who didn't make it, showing just how risky it is. Climbers often use extra oxygen tanks to help with the thin air, giving them a better chance to safely make it to the top and back. It's not a guarantee, but it helps a lot. Still, some climbers choose not to use extra oxygen, wanting to take on the mountain in the most challenging way possible. 5. Anatoly Bukriv Now here comes Anatoly Bukriv, a big name in mountain climbing who did some amazing things on the highest mountains in the world. His adventures are full of action and show how tough and persistent he is. Between 1989 and 1997, he climbed to the top of really tall mountains, those over 8,000 meters high, 18 times. Bukriv was known for doing things his way, especially when it came to not using extra oxygen and his actions during a very bad day on Everest in 1996. He was one of the first to reach the summit that day and then headed down early, thinking a big storm was coming. This move was key because it let him rest and then go out to rescue several climbers, including three of his clients, bringing them back to camp safely. The fact that Bukreev's clients made it in contrast to the tragic losses suffered by another team highlights the effectiveness of his decisions, even though some famous climbers disagreed with his methods. They thought climbers should use oxygen and stay closer to their clients. However, the survival of Bukreev's team members proved his approach worked. There was also some tension between Bukreev and Scott Fisher, another leader, about some decisions made during the climb. These disagreements added to the complex story of leadership and responsibility on Everest. After the disaster, Bukreev went on a solo climb to reflect on everything that had happened. His bravery and selflessness during the rescues were recognized in 1997 when he received a special award from the American Alpine Club. Despite the debates around his choices, Bukreev's story remains an important and moving part of mountain climbing history. 4. Pemba Dorje Another guy to check out is Pemba Dorje Sherpa. He's a guy pretty known for doing some seriously impressive stuff up in the big snowy Himalayas. Like, remember that time he zoomed up Everest in just 8 hours and 10 minutes? That was on May 21st, 2004. Crazy, right? But his journey's not all highs. There are lows too. So, three days after he broke that record, Pemba and his Alaskan buddy decided to take a hike from Everest's base camp to this chill spot called the football field, where the terrain is flat and peaceful. But then, out of nowhere, a massive gust of wind hits, and bam, an avalanche starts barreling down from Everest's west side. Quick-thinking Pemba manages to shield his pal and himself from the chaos of ice and snow. They emerge, covered in a blanket of white, but with a clear plan. Get out of there and fast. Over the radio, they start hearing about the tragedy. Sixteen climbers lost their lives in the avalanche. They might not have been close buddies of Pemba, but in a community like theirs, everybody knows everybody. For guys like Pemba, climbing Everest is like playing with fire. On one hand, you can make some serious cash, up to $8,000, which is a lot in Nepal. But on the other hand, it's dangerous, as heck. Pemba's got some history with the mountain, you know. Back in 2013, he had to deal with losing a friend at Camp the Thur. It's not just the physical challenges, though. There's this belief among Sherpas that the spirits of the dead stick around if they're not laid to rest properly. Heavy stuff. The day of the avalanche, Pemba's village, Fortsi, was in a panic, wondering if he was okay. When he finally made it back, the relief was palpable. His parents especially were over the moon. 
his dad, who knows a thing or two about guiding, and his mom, who couldn't stop crying tears of joy, showed just how much they've sacrificed for a better life beyond the shadow of Everest. 3. John Griffith John Griffith, a climber from Britain, went on this big adventure with his pals from Switzerland and Simone Moro from Italy. Their Everest adventure took a sharp turn after they had a big disagreement with some Sherpas, leading to a really tense situation and eventually making them leave the mountain much sooner than planned. Things got heated up there, with the Sherpas hiding their faces, even picking up rocks during the argument. The problem got really serious at Camp 2. That's when Melissa Arno, a well-known American climber, stepped in. She played a big role by warning Griffith and his crew about the danger they were in, probably saving them from getting hurt. At the core of this fight was a deep upset from the Sherpas. They felt that the Western climbers were treating them badly and not appreciating their hard work, despite the fancy base camps filled with luxuries. Even though Griffith and his mates tried to make up for any unintentional harm with apologies, they felt they had no choice but to stop their climb and head back down. Their way down was risky. They had to take less known paths to avoid running into the Sherpas again. This whole situation has sparked a lot of talk about how climbers and Sherpas get along on Everest. Some criticized Griffith and his team for not showing enough appreciation for the Sherpa's role in making Everest climbs possible. After all this happened, there's been a push by Nepalese officials and the climbing community to make sure future climbs are safer and that everyone gets along better. 2. The Story of the Yeti Let's go back to 1951, the year the whole world got hooked on the story of the Yeti all thanks to a British explorer named Eric Shipton. While he was walking around Mount Everest, looking for a new way up, he found something incredible, a footprint that looked like it belonged to no creature anyone knew. He took a photo of this footprint on the Menlung Glacier, right at the edge of Nepal and Tibet, and suddenly, everyone was talking about the Yeti, or what the local Sherpas call the Wild Man. There's this guy, Daniel Taylor, who wrote a book called Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery. He's super into finding out the truth about the Yeti, all the way from his home in West Virginia. He spent a lot of time thinking about that footprint Shipton and his buddy, Michael Ward, found. Everyone knew Shipton was a serious explorer, so no one doubted the photo was real. But who or what made that footprint is still a big question. Taylor points out how clear the footprint was and how it looked a lot like a human's, but with an odd thumb that made it seem more like something from a big primate, but still human-like. The footprint was huge, 13 inches long, which made people think of a really tall, mythical creature. The excitement about the Yeti really took off in 1954 when the Daily Mail newspaper wrote about it, making it famous worldwide. Then, people like Tom Slick, an American oil guy, got so into finding the Yeti that he took 500 porters and some dogs on big trips trying to track it down. These adventures show how much we love a good mystery and how curious we are about the natural world and the mysteries that are still out there. 1. Filled with trash. Mount Everest, known for touching the sky with its peak, faces a not-so-pretty situation. Despite being a part of the beautiful Sagamatha National Park since 1976 and recognized by UNESCO in 1979, it's got a problem with trash because of the 100,000 people who come to visit each year. These visitors are after the amazing views and the thrill of reaching the top, but they leave behind things like empty oxygen tanks, tents, and even human waste. This mess comes mostly from the 600 climbers and their teams who try to conquer the mountain every climbing season. The situation gets worse with climate change. As the snow and ice start to melt, all the trash that was hidden is now exposed, creating health risks for everyone living around Everest. 
The area's water sources are getting polluted, increasing the risk of diseases spread through water. To deal with this, the government of Nepal and various groups are trying hard to clean up Everest. They've started campaigns to collect trash and have put in place a deposit system. This system gives climbers back their $4,000 deposit if they bring down their trash from the mountain. The Sagamatha Pollution Control Committee, led by local Sherpas, is working on managing the waste better and teaching people about taking care of the environment. There's also the Mount Everest Biogas project, which aims to turn human waste into renewable energy, helping with sanitation issues and keeping the water clean. But it's tough. Nepal makes a lot of money from the fees climbers pay to climb Everest, which makes it hard to limit the number of people who want to climb it. Since Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay first reached the top in 1953, over 4,000 people have made it to the summit. Every year, more and more people are drawn to its challenge. For the Sherpa community, Everest is Komalungma, meaning goddess mother of the world, and it deserves efforts to keep it clean and beautiful, honoring its significance and the natural beauty it stands for. So, what are your thoughts on the astonishing footage captured on Mount Everest? I'm really curious to hear what you think about these incredible events. And let's keep our eyes open, because who knows what else we might find as we dive deeper into the mysteries of our adventure.